Hi, I am Mrs. Sloan, and this video is intended for my AP biologist. This is chapter 19, Taxonomy, Systematics, and Phylogeny. In video one, I went over taxonomy and systematics, and this is video two, and we're gonna focus on the um, phylogeny, and we're gonna focus on cladograms. I wanna re-remind you, um, to make sure that you look at the guides from the College Board about your expectations. Um, this is Unit 7. Um, and in this chapter, we address both phylogeny and common ancestry. You could hit pause if you wanted to and read through the expectations for both of these. And then this is the link to unit guides that I provide for my students. Um, uh, yeah, I think I'm going to jump to where we are. We did a little review. Here we go. So we're on phylogeny and let me go in presentation mode and make myself smaller. There we go. And I need a pen. Okay. Forgot to check sound. So I really hope this one's going to work. All right. So when we look at phylogenetic trees, we're really just trying to look at the you know, create a picture to show ancestry, who evolved from who, right? And we can use that um, in order to, in our taxonomy as well, like we discussed la in our last video. So a phylogenetic tree is constructed from traits that are shared. So for instance, they have shared traits here by all the species and then unique traits like flowering for angiosperms. And Every time a new trait evolves, you're gonna have a split right here at this node, and this would be a speciation event. So on your notes, we are, and by the way, my notes are down in the descriptor of the video, um, and the notes are two columns. Column one um, is the scaffolding, I'll help you fill that in, and then column two, I encourage my students to put pictures in there. So we are in 19.3 phylogeny, and interpreting phylogeny constructed from traits that are shared by a unique, um, shared by and unique to taxon and their common ancestor. When a new character or trait evolves, then the tree branches, which is what you're seeing right here. All right, so you look at two different characteristics when you're setting up your cladogram. You look at ancestral characters, which sounds exactly like it is. So it's shared in the ancestry and found within the entire line or clad. And then a derived trait, these are new and unique, um, not found in the common ancestor. So on your notes, you have that. Ancestral shared by all the lineage, and then derive new, not found in the common ancestor, and it's used to distinguish groups, used to distinguish groups. And I'm gonna give you several examples here, okay? So this would be an ancestral trait to both, okay? Because both of them have the ability to climb trees. However, this one can run along the branches and this one can swing from limb to limb. So these are their derived traits. And if we back up a little bit farther and you compare it to um, a caribou or reindeer, then they all three have mammary glands. So when you back up, you're backing up in time, okay, in time. Let's take a look here. For cladistics, when you look at all of these, they all share A, that's their ancestral trait, but then there's a split, some sort of speciation event. And now this one is the only one that has this trait B. Um, and a character or trait is any structural, so that would be morphology, chromosomal or molecular feature that distinguishes one group from another. So all of these, like you can see, share C, and then these would be the derived traits that are unique. This one has D and this one has E. So this is a very simple um, cladogram. And so I, when I talk about with my kids, I talk about who gets to be in the club. So for instance, the hagfish is a jawless, jawless fish. Um, and um, it, it does not have jaws, but everybody else in the rest of this clad all have jaws. So they're in the jaw club. But then perched, they don't have lungs, so they get dropped out, right? So, and you're assuming, right, that all of these, their common ancestor back here had jaws, right? And then over time, they have these new tr derived traits that evolved. Yes, look at the bird right here with feathers. This is odd, right? We're gonna, we're gonna talk about this. So remember your cladogram right here reflects your evolutionary history. Common ancestor and all its descendant lineages is called a clad. So 
let's talk about what is a cloud and what isn't a cloud, all right? So when you look, let's jump over here to the left first, okay? So when you look here, all of these have vertebrae, everyone, okay? But, and you can refer to this entire one here on the left as a cloud. But then when you look here at each branching point, that is a node. So look over here. This one in green, you could call what is in green a cloud because it's the ancestor and all of its descendants. Same here with this blue one, this ancestor and all of its descendants. This is not a cloud. Do you see why? Because it's not taking in all the other descendants over here and over here. You're picking and choosing. And you need to be aware of that when you're setting up your cladogram, right, as well. This is not, a, if we if we highlighted everything, it would be a clad. But since we're not including this group, it is not a clad. Hopefully that makes sense to you. Um, let me help you set one up. So let's look at a fish, a salamander, lizard, mouse, ape, and human. And this is super simple, like middle school simple, all right? So all of them have a back. Backbone. And then as you work through, you're going to go, okay, lungs. Does it do all of these have lungs? No, clearly, fish do not have lungs. I have set this up so it will work well. Who has claws, etc.? And you would fill in this chart. Very simple. Okay. So your ancestral trait here, okay, would be a backbone because all of them have a backbone. Okay, and then you would go, all right, what do I need to set up next? Well, all of them have lungs except the fish. So my next character I would put here is lungs, and then I would stick my fish as now an out group from that, all right? And then you would just work your way through each of these traits, putting them each in their places, all right? So this club becomes more and more specific as we work our way up. So a human would be more closely related to a mouse than it would a salamander because they had shared traits for longer. Does that make sense? So that's why it shows your ancestral history. Let's take a look here and talk about the principle of parsimony. When you set it up, you want to go simple. The simpler, the better. Okay, so here you can see some different shapes and some different colors. And I'll give you real data here in just a minute. When you set it up this way, so you have this ancestral shape color, Okay, here you had everybody was square, right? We had a blue square here. We have a yellow square for this shared ancestry. Only one thing needed to change. This one needed to get a new trait where it went from being yellow to blue. So he's now out of the club because all the rest are yellow, okay? And then here we needed to change from square, right, to yellow. So that is your second change. If you set it up this way instead, okay, then you have one, two, three changes. And the same goes here. Principal parsimony says go with the simplest way. That's the more likely way it would occur. For instance, if you look at these cladograms, which one do you think is the best cladogram? The first, the second, or the third? Well, hopefully you see the first because what would happen here is you have Z who has this ancestral trait, X loses it, and then Y regains it. That, that doesn't make as much sense. And the same thing here with Y and Z. But if we have here a common ancestor, then all of them share this one. X, Y, and Z share it, and then Y and Z diverge later. And they are probably more than likely more closely related. Okay, and here. Okay, so let's make it less simple. So here we're gonna we're gonna compare a lancelet, an eel, a newt, a snake, and a lizard, and just put an X in which traits they have. And it's it doesn't fall into the same kind of pattern that easy peasy one I had you do before because we don't know what to do with these traits. But we can see a pattern here. All of them share this would be their ancestral characteristic, this note accord. We may not be able to use this as a trait. This may be a result of convergent evolution. Maybe it evolved separately. So when you would set up a cladogram here, your ancestral trait would be the note accord because all they all had that in common. And so when we're deciding which traits we're gonna use, we're not gonna use the four bony limbs and the long cylindrical body. We might leave those out um, and instead, we're going to put our lancelet here as our outgroup because it's the only one who doesn't have vertebrae. And then from here up, they all have vertebrae. From here up, they all have lungs. Here up, they all have amniotic eggs. You may not 
be able to use every single character when you're setting that up. So let me help you on your notes. Um, number two, um, uses the principle, oh, I owe you more, sorry. Cladistics, method that uses shared drive characters to develop a hypothesis of evolutionary history, evolutionary history. A cladogram reflects that evolutionary history. Common ancestor and all of its descendant lineage, lineages is called a clad. I gave you out group and in group. Um, uses principle of parsimony when deciding which traits to use. The minimum number of assumptions is the most logical. Go simple. Do not have a character evolving twice. And your best cladograms have the fewest unexplained. These would be unexplained, right? Your best cladograms have the fewest unexplained um, differences, all right? And um, you need to be very careful of convergent evolution where um, you don't want to use that as one of your morphological traits if they're just solving their problem in the same way. Now, you can use morphology. You could even use behavior possibly, but what's really good to use is biochemical evidence. That gives you, that shows you the pathway you took by the number of differences that you have between you and another related species, how many mutations you have. For instance, if we go all the way back 65 million years ago, right, all of these, both the whales, the cow, and the human, they all share a common ancestry of a mammal, right? Then we diverged and the cow is still, right, with our tooth and baleen whales, but then they lost their common ancestor somewhere around 59 million years ago. There was a divergence, right, a speciation. And then once again, around 37 million years ago. And here we can see this baleen whale here, all of the rest of these tooth whales, they have a loss and it's, it's two genes, MX1 and MX2. This is something interesting here, but that particular gene coding for that protein has to do with the ability to fend, defend yourself against DNA and RNA viruses and they all share that loss. There's some too many stop codons, there's some deletions of some exons, some frame shift mutations that have taken place in this common ancestor that all of these tooth whales evolved from. So using biochemical evidence um, is even more, uh, gives you more evidence, concrete evidence, instead of just morphology that you're worried about convergent evolution. So this is if you're, this is interesting to you, hit pause and you can fill this in as well. Okay, um, next, um, when you look at traditional taxonomy, um, birds have their own group, right? They are the class A. Remember, domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. So birds have their own class. Reptiles have a class. Mammals have a class, right? But this is odd because you have these unique traits evolving, right? But yet they're um, put in their own individual class. And really they very, very much share a, a common ancestor with a dinosaur. So um, when you have um, polytomy, which is what is here, you, you don't have a, just a branching into two, but a branching into three, um, that has more than two immediate descendants, that, that's a problem for Cladus. Um, and so they would rearrange this so that dinosaurs and birds share a common ancestor. So on your notes, strict cladis don't think there should be a class um, reptilia because it doesn't include all of the organisms derived from early reptiles, including the birds, right? And then tracing phylogeny, um, when you read it, just a couple of things I want to go over with you. You read it like a family tree showing patterns of shared ancestry between lineages. So this is your ancestor. Then these are your one, two, three, four descendants. This is the past or more recent. Every time you see a node right here, that's a speciation event. Um, and then each lineage has unique traits to itself. So A, B, and C all have unique traits to themselves, but B and C share this common ancestry right here. Okay, so I just wanted to give you just a little chart to help you with that. This might be a good thing to screenshot and pop into your notes. All right, so can you use fossils? Sure, but this is gonna show you um, morphological structures only, right? Unless you're able to get some DNA from your fossils, 
right? Um, it's going to show you structural differences. And you wouldn't always know about um, convergent evolution. So um, you use homologous structures and be careful of those analogous structures, which are a result of convergent evolution. So on your notes, um, fossil traits limited by the types of structures that are fossilized. Morphological traits use homologous structures and be careful of analogous structures that are a result of convergent evolution. You can even use potentially behavioral traits, um, but again, that's for organisms that are alive, right? Um, so if it can be identified, if it can be identified. And then when you talk about um, the molecular clock, which we referenced in an earlier chapter, you're looking at mutational rate, right? So molecular data comparing the relationship of certain primate species based on a study of looking at their genomes of sharing common ancestors and having these speciation events. So the greater the number of shared DNA sequences between species, the greater number of shared genes, and therefore the greater evidence that they do have a common ancestor. So for instance, when we look at our ancestral primate here, then we branched off a long time ago from the lemurs. And you can see each of these would be a speciation event. So did we evolve from a chimpanzee? No. Could we have a common ancestor? Sure. Okay. And when you talk about this, this molecular clock, you have your ancestral gene indicated here by all white, right? But then you have a split. And this one had the red purple mutation, just using colors to simplify. This one had the gray blue. Then it split again. They still have the evidence within their genes that tells them where they came from. They both have the gray blue mutation, but they have this, this new mutation of the light blue and the green. So when you're doing this with color, it's really easy, right? But you're going to be looking at this with sequences of DNA or the proteins, the sequence of amino acids in proteins. So protein comparisons, um, I think I, I need to give you, nope, we're good, okay? So molecular clock, let me fill you in there. Molecular clock is number of neutral mutations, not based on selection, not based on selection. And so... On your sequence comparisons, you use amino acids and proteins and nucleotide sequences in DNA, including um, mitochondrial DNA. Um, mitochondrial DNA mutates 10 times faster than nuclear DNA. Um, and so that would be one that would be used for closely related species. So you use mitochondrial DNA, which mutates um, 10 times faster than nuclear DNA. And then a really slow mutating one is, um, is our RNA, right? The RNA found in ribosomes. That one's the slowest of all. All right, and um, that's the end. Here I thought I would show you a really detailed cladogram of all of life. And if you're one of my students, I will see you in class.